right, welcome to Sagas and Sass Season 2. I'm Tara, along with fellow hosts Nick and Nami. This episode will cover Empire of Gold, the third and final book in S.A. Chakraborty's Devabod trilogy. If you're watching live, join us in the chat or after the fact, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Sagas and Sass to continue the conversation. And just a reminder, the views expressed in the shows are those of the hosts as individuals and do not necessarily represent the show as a whole. All right. When Empire of Gold begins, it's with a doozy of a prologue that finally puts us in Maniza's head. And y'all, she is somehow even more evil than we thought she was without going into too much detail. She straight up offers Nari's true given name to the Ifrit. Knowing that this will likely lead to her daughter becoming a slave, perhaps that should have given us an inkling of what is to come, but we'll get to that a bit later. Because first we meet back up with Nari and Ali, who are alive and eventually even kind of well in Egypt. They spend some time with Nari's apothecary friend, Jakob, but eventually go on their not-so-merry way because Ali finally convinces her that eventually they'll be discovered anyway, and so they head off to... Dimitri and his Anali family, only to be attacked along the way by an Ifrit, but thankfully saved by a Marid named Sobek. Oh, and they also have a run-in with some pirates, but they convince the enslaved Shafi from the crew to mutiny and then bring them to Dimitri. When they arrive at Hatset's home, Hatset being Ali's mother, it's clear that she wants to keep her son safe and sound there. But it turns out the other Marid are not too happy with what's been going on, and they threaten to decimate Tanitri unless Ali surrenders to them. Now, part of this is because they want Suleiman's seal, but Ali convinces Nar Nari to remove it from him. And not only does she succeed, but it turns out that she can wear the ring after all, because Manitza apparently just lied her butt off in Kingdom of Copper. So Ali does surrender to the Marid, who hold him captive for a while, and eventually try to force him to fight to the death of Sobek. But this doesn't go the way the Marid thought it would, and they are forced to release Ali. Meanwhile, the Peri sent a Shadu to bring Nari to to meet with them because as it turns out they finally decided to get involved in the Deva war they give her a special blade and tell her to kill dara so i guess it's back to deva bots for our somewhat unlikely heroine speaking of they've bought things have gone really bad there like really 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 bad without magic the city its people its food supplies everything have fallen into disarray Manisa is barely holding on, and then Dara just obeys her to save one of his soldiers who's being held by the Gaziri. Dara is gravely injured in the process, and in order to save him, Manisa uses the Nahid corpses that were found in the secret palace vault and also binds him to her as her slave. But that's later. Oh god, I skipped ahead. I'm doing <laughs> uh, well, she bound him to her, yeah. and it was like was first then she, able to and it was like oh i had to do this to save you first yeah. she just binds him to her and then she's like oh by the way i'm also going to use this bond to straight up enslave you now so uh see what we mean now that maniza is clearly all whatever about deva being enslaved we probably should have seen this coming also she's the worst in the end, everyone meets back up in Devabad for the fight of the century, or should we say centuries? Either way, for a time it seems as if the good guys will lose, considering the immense amount of power Dara is wielding and the fact that he is completely in Manitza's command. But in the end, he is able to trick her, though not before she reveals that Nari is actually her niece, the daughter of her brother and a Shafit woman who had worked at the palace. Nari is also able to trick the Perrys and doesn't have to kill Dara at all, after all, which probably doesn't bode well for some distant future when the Perrys want to get their revenge, but for now, Nari is alive and well, divorced from Mudadir and able to work in her hospital, while Ali begins building a ruling council, and Dara hides off in search of the Deva relics that an Ifrit stole with the intent of releasing them into the human world. Plus, Mundadir and Jamshid get to be together, and Zainab gets to go on adventures with her friend-turned-probable-love interest, Akiza. Some people call this ending bittersweet, and I guess we'll delve into whether or not we agree with that conclusion now. All right. So Nami has some things to say about <laughs> our last episode on uh, Kingdom of Copper. Uh, she wanted to answer our question uh, about what, you know, who you would want to be in Devabad. Uh, 
and whatnot. So I don't know. Yeah, t t take it away with with uh, some things that will lead into further city uh, empire of gold, city of brass. Wow, I'm all backwards. Wait, empire of gold discussion. Here we get. I how confused I was because we had just read Empire of Ivory and Temeraire, yeah. and now we have Empire of Gold, and I was just like, ah, titles. <laughs> but anyway, so speaking of who I w want to be. I think want is a very important term because I would literally just not want to be in Thavabot. Like, do not put me in there. <laughs> Let yeah. me out. No, thank you. But if I had to pick and be like, this is who I would be, I'd probably be the Shafiq doctor. Because again, like, it's me. Bio. Biology, not me. But fantasy biology, not me. <laughs> pretty much doctor also like the moment that suba shows up in this book and she straight up just shoots dara and you're like yes. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Also, like correct me if i'm wrong but i'm like pretty sure she's sh like at the end like she's in the book again and she's like bitch i will shoot you again like don't <laughs> yeah i think so too <laughs> Like yeah, Nick messaged me the other day when he read that passage where Siva uh, shoots Dara. I was like, oh, my God. And my response was, like, very, very short because it's like we lost our dog that day. So I was like, yeah, I know. So <laughs> I was like, I am. I like I, I thought this was I, I thought this was cool, too. I just don't have the spoons yeah. right now <laughs> to talk about it. <sighs> Yeah, but so I guess I want to jump right into my biggest, biggest thing with this book, because I know there was a lot of discussion last time about how, like, the Nari and Muntadir wedding just kind of, it didn't seem necessary. And I want to say that it it's so necessary in this book. And, like, the reason is because it's foreshadowing that Nari can control the ring and Suleiman seal this whole time. Mm -hmm. And that Maniza was lying to her. Because Ghazan would have never, ever had his son mm -hmm have a Shafiq child if that child could not also wield the seal. Like, like Ghassan is not an idiot. He he would have never done that. Yeah. And like that secret, the only person who would have found out that Nari was also like, you know, Shafiq would have been one to there when he got the ring. And just like, so like that wedding, because I remember even like reading that scene at the end of the second book, I was like, huh, so weird that Shafiq can't wield the ring because their kid would have been Shafiq, so th would that just mean the end of the, like, royal line? Like, yeah. Ghassan wouldn't do that. That doesn't make sense. And I remember being, like, very suspicious of Maniza saying that, and then, like, turns out in this book that Nari actually can do it, and I'm like, Ooh! <laughs> Also, I think the wedding makes a lot of sense because it really is five years that goes by. Like, I don't think Ghassan would have had like the potential of a political marriage with Nari for five years and not done anything about it. And I think that's why it makes big sense to me there. Also because it was, uh, I don't know. I just, oh my god. I, I think that my biggest thing was like with the ring because the whole time that sequence was happening in the second book, I was like, that can't be right. How would, Ghassan's not that dumb. Is he? He seems to have all of this so under control. Huh. <laughs> And then Maniza, and then it turns out she was just a lying liar, and yeah. A lying liar who lies. Yeah, honestly, I did, I can't believe I didn't, that thought didn't even cross my mind that, of course, like, it, like, Nari being Shafi, if her and Muntadir had a kid, their kid would be at least, you know, I mean, I, I, Ghassan, I, I, I guess he must assume that they're, that, that Nari is at least half Shafi. I don't think he really knows for sure, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't so really think about the idea that their kid would be, you know, as far as Ghassan is possibly like concerned, at least 25% Shafiq and it, it definitely, it would definitely be even less than that. Cause the way, um, cause mm. Nari's yeah, yeah. father is Shafiq as well. Right. So if he's Shafiq, that's like half Jin blood, at least for her mother. And maybe the only human blood she has is from her father. So that means that she would be 75% Jin. And like, you know, like you don't really ever get like the exact like level right. of like Shafi. And you also know that like Deva's already like kidnap and basically like pass off Shafi children as their own. So it's like it's gross, but it makes a lot of sense that there really isn't a difference. And it's just racism. Love that fantasy racism. 
stares off into the distance and fancy yeah, good times <laughs> good times <laughs> um so uh and th th this is one thing that i i know i complained about like even after the second book i was like we still have like almost no information about the marine and where the heck are the Perry and all of this? Why were they part of this at all? So we got quite a bit more, like a lot, a lot more about the Marine and uh, not a ton about the Perry, but enough that at least it was like, okay, I, I get it now. I get why, you know, they were included from the beginning and everything. So. I think the thing that amused me the most about the Perry, so like at the very end, was that it was like it wasn't even like they really cared. It was just like when you hate a dude enough to literally change the course of the world because you're just like, just kill this dude and we'll do what you want. Like, like well, move. yeah. Well, I mean, and also like the the Marid that took over Ali and and tried to use Ali to kill Dara was uh, not itself at the time, you know. But like, it, it wasn't. It wasn't thinking beyond kill this asshole. <laughs> you know you're bad when most of the magical world just wants to murder you. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of pronunciation things. It's Shafit and Marid. Oh, Marid, okay. I'm probably still going to pronounce it. It's okay. I, just I read the book, not listen. So like, it's like, yeah. you can tell me these things. I will try, but I, I can't practice. I completely understand. I just <laughs> wanted to mention it. <laughs> um but yeah so so we got a lot more about uh, really the the marid marid uh, like marid. tons more about them i mean we literally got to see you know their stronghold essentially and yeah. uh what's her name tiamat the queen or whatever you want to call her of the the marid like which i that whole thing the way she was described as looking and her size and everything i was just like oh okay and like, like this whole like here are my statues once every century i let a couple of them wake up and fight each other to the death for the possibility of freedom like wow wow just like it really like sort of the marit especially like preys on that like fear of water and like the deep dark depths and the unknown and just like the descriptions of them from the beginning like ollie at the end of the first book when he comes up and he's like covered in like sea gunk it was mm. just very davy jones vibes from pirates of the caribbean and mm -hmm. like that never stopped and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and then like even sobek who's like you know like he is like their ally in all of this and he's ollie's like ancestor technically and like nari's shafit fa shafit family side is like like they worship Sobek and like all of this and even knowing that like he's a bloodthirsty crocodile like it's it's kind of it, they're just so like terrifying but cool because it's like I remember when like all of this first started and it was like because normally when you get like fantasy like earth wind fire water creatures they're all like cool and beautiful and in this I I just like how Chakraborty doesn't like hesitate to just go all in into the terrifying it's like yeah they're magical and they're terrifying and don't you heckin forget it and like the deva are kind of the exception to that because even the ifrit are like terrifying and the peri are just terrifying bird people and the marit are just terrifying sea boogeyman and terrifying oh i'll tell you what when when you just said like the idea of like you know the fear of like the deep dark like just depths of the sea and everything. All I can think of is this time I went snorkeling off, like I think it was Grand Turk in the Turks and Caicos. And uh, we went to the edge of the shelf where it just drops off into like mm -hmm. oblivion. Like it, it literally goes from a few hundred feet deep to like tens of thousands. And I was like snorkeling on. I'm like, I got to see this, right? I got to see this thing just once to say I've seen it. And I, I like, I got to the point where I was like right on, like my my face was like right on the cusp of like, like I could see over the edge and I was like, nope, going back in the boat now. Don't want any more part of this, bye. <laughs> no, I thank you. immensely scared of deep water and honestly most water and water is terrifying. I, ugh, no, oh God. And the idea that the marriage just kind that. of like exist in it and just pop up and you know do what they do. 
and like as for the the Perrys, like they um like I said, they don't have it as big of a part. Like you you basically they have a conversation with Nari and they tell her, We want Dara dead. Here's here's uh, you know, sort of sword to do it with, special sword. And yeah, that's and then and then at the end when she stabs herself instead of Dara and they're like damn it Nari like shakes fist uh <laughs> and they're like angry and everyone's like wow you really shouldn't have pissed the fairies off and I'm just like I mean maybe it'll come back to haunt her like they talk about how maybe it's gonna come back to haunt her but maybe not I guess like they seem I mean to really just Let's be fair, they're immortal beings, so it's wholly possible that they're nurse a grudge for so long that she's gonna straight up die and they'll be like, oh, oh shit. We, oh shit. We forgot. <laughs> we forgot to take revenge while she was alive. Well, who's next Now then? what do we do? And also um, I mean, it was certainly that. brave of her and smart of her to trick them the way she did, so. I mean, I like how they, like, until the very end, they, like, kept the con artist in Nari, you know? Like, what yeah. she does at the end was just, like, she bluffs them and she calls their bluff and just love her. A plus, Nari. Good job. Well, I mean, and, and I honestly feel like Dara wouldn't have known to trick Manitza the way he did had it not been for the time he spent with Nari. Like, I can't say I'm definite on that, but I do feel no, I you. I, like the I time didn't... he spent with her is probably what it, 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 it certainly wasn't a plan up until almost literally the moment it happened. But I don't know that he would have. It makes thought a of lot it. of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Cause I think my thing, like the thing that I wrote in our, like, what should we talk about, Doc, in all caps, was Dara is naive. Like, he is so, so naive in everything he does. It's and so it's because of that naivete and that willingness to follow his authority figure that he commits genocide and then is like, should I not have done that? I don't know. Like, and <laughs> God, like, like the level of brainwashing that exists in Deva society about the not real peopleness of the Shafit is like a lot because you see that in like some of the things that Jamshid says, and you see that in how Kabe be behaves and how Nizreen behaves and all of that. But like, even beyond all of that, like Dar is a fucking idiot. Like, he's naive as hell and willing to believe the authority figure. And when you think about it, like, he was an actual child when they gave him the order. And it also seems like, so this is the sort of, like, backstory that I've constructed in my head, by the way. Because it seems like it was a punishment for something his father did. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. Because, like, his father, like, you, ba you find out that his father was basically sent to die on the front lines and that he was, like, literally standing there looking ashamed and, like, terrified at the same time when Dara's called to do this. So this was definitely meant as a punishment for his father because they knew that this naive baby would do whatever they said. And it's just like, ooh, just love the levels of corruption in the government that you see in here all the time. It's a bit too close to home. Thanks, fantasy. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, the, I think in the, in the, in the beginning, we're kind of not led to believe, but it's kind of, it's, it's strongly insinuated that things were so much better under Nahid rule. Mm -hmm. And then like, other than for the Shafit of Sh Shafit, Shafit, am I saying that right? Oh my God. Now I can't, not, not, Shafit, whatever. Now, now I'm, now I'm going to just continually mess it up and wonder about it. <laughs> um, like other than for them, like it, we're led to believe that for, you know, everybody else, like, everything was just peachy keen and great. And then it turns out that they were just as terrible. I mean, the whole thing kinda... where Dara talks about how the, or maybe, maybe it's not Dara, but they, they, you find out that the Nahid council had just had gone from like 13 to like five or six. And, you know, so at the end it was less than half of its original like numbers. And why, you know, they don't, they don't ever explain well, why, but you, you have never... to, 
you never get details, but like you find out, like it's so strange because the way it sounds, like the way that you're kind of told everything in the beginning, it it's made to sound that Dara was this like crazy extremist who went off and did this thing without, and like the council may or may not have known about it, but like Dara was the bad guy. And by the end, you realize that it was like a lot of political maneuvering and just a corrupt body that had started really, really good and then just became incredibly corrupt. Because the other thing you find out is the real story behind the hospital. Because obviously, like Nari never finds out about it because Ollie doesn't tell her. But Ollie like discusses in one of his POVs that he's like, oh yeah, like they were doing experimentations on the Shafi in this hospital to like find ways to kill them and eventually the reason that the battle started is because Zaidi al Katani had a Shafi wife back home in Am Gazira and what the experiments that they did in that place was to like enchant the Gaziri swords to or like their weapons or something to like poison Shafi who held them or touched them and so these Gaziri soldiers it didn't affect them because they were purebloods but then a lot of them went back to Am Gazira and their Shafi families or relatives, and it killed their relatives. And that's the reason that Zaidi began his rebellion because of that. And it's like, like getting all that backstory. I just remember that moment of being like, holy shit, like Zaidi was correct. Because this whole time, you're sort of like, you're given this image of like the Al Qatani family, and like you're given this image of how, you know, Shafi are still treated terribly under Ghassan, which they are, but that was also apparently a recent development of the last like two or three monarchs in like over a thousand years of Ghassan, of Al Qatani like monarchs. And it was just, it was so interesting to understand all like the like nuances of why these things happened as they did, and then eventually every single power structure just succumbing into corruption so like you know what started with zadi wanting to free the shafi because of that terrible thing that the that the nahids did to like kill all the shot the shafi like what really started as a good thing has once again turned into Ghassan like persecuting the shafi so hard that muntadir genuinely believes that the shafi like don't deserve rights and like like all of that and then like the badness of the nahid council and just I like how the more you get in this story and in this series, the more political machinations continue to come to light. And you're just like, oh, everything sucks and everything turns into corruption. That was my ramble about Zadie al Katani. <laughs> that was good ramble. <laughs> oh, wait, but I had final Dara thoughts because... <laughs> Well, so, I mean, we have some, there's so much to say about Dara. We might as well just get it off the plate right? now. <laughs> we started Dara, so we might as well finish Dara. And I think, you know, like, I think seeing his POV, totally agree. Emo boy through and through. Like, please, sir, can we not? But also, like, by the end of his arc, when he finally stands, like, standing up to Maniza and having the story end with him killing the big bad instead of Nari or Ollie doing it. Just it made a lot of sense, especially because it was like, like it's the start of his redemption arc, and then his like essentially banishment to do his like thousands of years of penance since he's essentially an immortal now, and find all the people that like are are suffering as you did, so you can restore them, and like it's like I just really liked that end to his story. I. It was one of those things that I I never thought there would be an ending to Dara's story that I would be content with because I still don't like him. Absolutely don't like him. Garbage man. Throw him out. But his character arc was really good. And his story ending with him killing Maniza on paper and then going on this like essentially eternal journey of retribution because the way they describe this task it's essentially impossible. But like mm. it's just it's it's very Fitting. And the fact that at the beginning of the second book, he's very much ready to die and be with his sister. And at the end of the third book, he like tells Nari to save him so he can continue his redemption and truly actually do that. I was like, well, dang, I guess I have to say it, but we love growth at this house. Yeah, seriously. Right. And also, you know, the fact that he chooses to do that. This is his yeah. idea. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even think at this point Nari knows what happened 
to those relics, right? Like, yeah, nobody has any idea. So basically like said that the only reason like the three freed Ifrit's relics or the three freed Jin's relics were even found in the first place was just literally sheer luck. And it's like very much laid out there as like, this is not a realistic task. Like this will not, this is not something you can realistically do intentionally for even one relic. And he's doing it for hundreds. And it was just very good. It it was a very good and satisfying end to his story that I never thought I would actually get. Because let me be real, the idea of him toiling for eternity to get these Jin back makes an angry part of me happy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh I don't know, Nick. Like, did you? Are you? Are you on on board with us here? Like, we we do we all agree on the fact that it's great that Dara is if he's gonna live. I guess that uh, he's going about this, you know, hunt for relics. Yeah, I don't. I still don't like him, but it was oh. good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's a thing. You don't have <laughs> to you can acknowledge somebody's growth and still dislike them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely, you never have to forgive yeah. somebody. And I guess is it is it truly a redemption arc? Is there another term for like a character that maybe can't be redeemed? I feel like if anything, but... it's like a taking off his rose-colored glasses arc. Yeah, like I said, like Dara's naivete continued to astound me throughout well, the series. I think Manitza kind of ripped those glasses off of his face. Honestly, I mean, uh, he was obviously very just like Ugh, about what she did to bring him back in the first place, and then my God. She just straight up enslaves him. I mean, that was just, it was like, okay, listen, like, Manitza is bad, right? We all knew Manitza that was wasn't bad. Even, that wasn't even the turning point for him. I think the moment when he really was like, okay, she's beyond redemption is when he realized that she was straight up, like, it, like killing all the devas who possibly were associated with the nobles who may have potentially conspired with Munta there to kill Kave. And like, she literally just starts murdering people left and right and goes on a murder spree. And I think it was only the actual like killing of Devas that made him stop and think that, wait a second, maybe, maybe well, all my suspicions are correct. Cause up until then it was only like, like he was having doubts about things and he was like not listening to her. But that was like the moment when he was like irredeemable bad. And the the thing about it though, was like up to up until then, I'm like, you know, like everything she's done up until now is irredeemable. It just hasn't been to your own. People. Well, I guess my <laughs> question is though, she wasn't just killing them, right? She was also trying to get them to reveal their true names because she was she wasn't just killing them. She killed them. She, she was, killed some yeah. of them too, but she was also trying to like she was also enslaving or hel- helping them to be enslaved, correct? Yeah, I don't know if she was enslaving them herself or if she was selling them to Well, no, she was yeah, she she herself wasn't making them her slaves, but she yeah. was giving them into slavery and it's like I mean, the slaver who sells the slaves is just as bad, if not worse, than the people who are enslaving them. I mean, they're all garbage. (laughs) Yeah, like, like, they're all garbage, but... I think the thing is that, like, Dara gets out of his naivete, but it takes so goddamn long, and the only thing that truly clicks in his head is that she's doing to his people what the Ifrit did to him, and then he was like, oh, this is unforgivable. Like, all her other crimes, he was like, I disagree, but we could still be friends. And I'm just like, Dara, what? Dara, why? (laughs) Yeah, I don't... Oh, but she's so time. awful. She's so awful. And like, so, I so going from Dara. Energetically awful she is. Yeah. Well, because like the other thing is, you know, it, it, we we get, what we get from her and what we get about her in the first book is so vague and it's like, you you feel kind of bad for her, right? And so even in the second book, up, up until, you know, she's just like, okay, kill everything. Like, or okay, yeah, I'm, I'm just like... A, 
losing this poison on all the Katsiri, you know, you feel like she had it so rough and it's like, you still feel like a little bit bad for her, but then, oh my gosh, she just takes it to the next level. Like in 20 she different levels in this book, she, um, it, 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 you know, the, the giving up Nari's name at the very beginning, Nari's true given name, um, you know, so that knowing that that means that the, if the Ifrit are able to get a hold of Nari, they will enslave her. And then doing what she does to Dara and doing what she does to all the other Deva, just because, you know, because she's upset about what happened to Kava. And let's be real, Kava's death was terrible. But um, I... If she is the worst, I mean, it, 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 because then when, when you it. when you get uh, Nari's like birth story and like uh, the story about who she really is and the fact that Manita was legit, like, yeah, let's sacrifice this this baby. Oh my god, like she is just there is she was always bad. She was always bad, and it it just it brought me back to that whole like, uh. I know she had a terrible life, right? I know she did, but at the same time, well, like really using really using really your trauma as an excuse to like, I don't know, literally like, like to enslave and murder others and like possibly like murder like babies in the crib and stuff is just, or like it, as the second they come out of the womb, I, oh my God. So Manisa, I really like her as a villain because she showcases a very like important subtype of villain which is not the the kind that one feels they're morally justified but even beyond that the kind of like person who weaponizes their trauma and uses that to like hurt other people and then beyond that she's like She's very much a bad person that was always kind of a little bit bad and then was born into a bad circumstance, became worse, and then used the bad things that happened to her as an excuse to do even worse. And the fact that Maniza is so, like, in her head, she's like, this is all justified because of what happened to me is terrifying. And I love that for her. I think she's a great villain because she's so horrific and everything she does is so absolutely horrific. And she's such a contrast to her brother because her brother, like, yeah, he was dead before, like 20 years before this story even started. But like, you see what an actual, like, good person in that situation would have become, which was what her brother did. And which is what Nari did, because Nari was also in the same situation just 20 years later when she comes to Devabad. And, like, it just, it all kind of clicks how terrible Maniza is and how a person that terrible will start to just use other things to justify being terrible and never actually reflect on it. And it was just, oh, she's the worst. I love it. Well, I mean, and Nick, I'd love to hear your opinions on her, like, weaponizing of her trauma, because I know you've done a lot of some work, maybe, but definitely a lot of research and stuff into, um, you know, mental health and, and whatnot. I mean, so yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on how Manitza acts, reacts, etc. You're muted, by the you're way. Muted. You're muted. There we go. Uh, I mean, shit. Like, <laughs> mental health and trauma in particular, it, it does a number on the best of us, but it is never an excuse for shitty behavior. And maniza has got about the shittiest behavior. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> there's not really any, like, there's zero justification for a lot of her actions. And I do appreciate that, you know, she had a very, she had a terrible past and that helped shape who she is. Uh, but she literally was up for sacrificing babies. So like, not cool. Never going to be cool. Never going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like the other thing is it's like sacrificing her beloved brother's baby like what yeah. the fuck what the fuck there are so many levels of like concerning psychopath behavior in everything that Niza does and then it just like 
never, ever, ever gets better. Oh, yeah. And she, like, literally tries to play it as though she was the one who was trying to stop uh, the the baby sacrifice. And, yeah. Like, she that's... straight up <laughs> lies to Dara about it. And Dara's yeah. like, yeah, the passive nice brother was, like, chill about this, about baby murder. Yeah, this tracks. And I'm just like, well, and he's not. He's yeah, like, that doesn't whole make any sense to me, but like, I guess if Maniza says it's true, then it must be true. Like, that's the part that blows my mind even more. It's not like he's like, oh, it tracks. It's like, oh, this doesn't track at all, but I'm still going to accept it because she said that that's what happened. Absurdity. It's worse. Naive, naivete. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that blind is. trust in your leader for really. No good no reason because he hasn't didn't actually it. know Manitza, right? She hasn't earned it at all, and he's just like, Oh, yes, yep. my naked praised be. And I'm like, Dark, can we not? She's a psychopath, so concerning. Oh my god, but yeah, no, I love her as a villain because it's very rare that you get just a female villain who's unapologetically the worst, and she is. And I love it. And then she yeah, died. I, mean, I love that. I'm a big fan of all of it. Oh April. yeah. Her her like because I mean I of course it's like you know as you're reading that there's no way. Sorry guys. <laughs> Good. There's no way uh there's no way that she's going that, that that they're going to lose, right? Right? Like this is a trilogy. Right. We might not get a an overall happy ending, but you know, there's there's a long period there where it's like, how could they possibly win? You know what I mean? Um, so the and the way the way it all happened was, you know, pleasantly unexpected. Um, mm -hmm. It's like you you expect there to be some trick or whatever, but you didn't. You don't necessarily expect Dara to be the one that actually does the yeah. deed. And yeah, it's it's just really. Uh, like, there were a lot of surprising things in that, like, last ending sequence. And, like, first was, like, the Nari breaking out of, like, the slave thing because she was, like, no, like, my identity is Nari. Like, I have two names. That whole thing was super cool. Then there was, like, the, like, Jamshid trying to, like, get both of them to live somehow. And then Maniza revealing to Jamshid that Nari was willing to let him die because she thought Ali could win. And they both would die and she was cool with that. And she just being like, I can't believe the two most important people in my life are the same. My sister and my goddamn boyfriend have the same attitude in life. Fine, I guess. <laughs> and the fact that he just We're sided with, her, with that was just so good. And that was so good. And then like, Ollie just literally being like, I'm a fish now. And, like, like fighting the whole, like, and like bringing the whole, like, water military wow navy navy <laughs> no i think water military fits in this in this it seems way more accurate, honestly yeah <laughs> it's just like a bunch of ramshackle ships and like and then the marin magic is just like what if what if we made you shiny it's just like it's, it's literally the flying dutchman times a billion that's what he does and like that happening and then nari being like what if i just died now <laughs> and then <laughs> like like i swear this book was one of those books that was like oh my god like i must be almost finished because like i got to the part where there was so back and everything and i'm like this is obviously halfway through 20 percent through they get like kidnapped by pirates obviously we're like three quarters of the way not even halfway <laughs> like, like literally like the entire like that final confrontation action i'm pretty sure happens in like two chapters and it's like chapters like the last like Two before the final two, and I was just sitting there, and I'm like, "How are they going to solve it all? How are they going to solve it all? How are they going to solve yeah. it all?" And you, and like in most theories, like I can, I can kind of see the solution coming, or I can see how they'll get from point A to point B. But I was like fully team hot set when she was like, "Guys, just like start your new kingdom here. There is literally no way this is going to work." I was like, "Guys, I hate to agree with the mom, but like I do agree with the mom. This is not going to work. Y'all well, can't win." 
And in our last episode, uh, our, our Kingdom of Copper episode, Nick and I were just on about hot set. Like, we were just like, we love her, actually. Like, when you finally get to know her, and even in this one where you know she's wrong, you know, you know sh- that they're not really going to be safe there, that this, that her plan and everything isn't going to be, isn't going to work the way she wants it to, et cetera. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I, she just. I love her. She's great. Her. She's great. She's, she's. It's so- a great mom. She's a great mom. Like it's so funny to me. So little like, power, and but she still did, and she still used what she had and did everything she could to keep her children safe. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's so funny to me because I'm used to like the fantasy trope of absent or shitty parents, mm. and like having Gasan be shitty parent. I was like, yep, of course, like it's all going to be shitty parent. And then Hotsit shows up, and she's just so kick ass the whole time, mm-hmm. and like. And just everything about her is amazing. And I just, I remember my friend who told me to read this series, she's a huge hot sit stand. And I remember being in the first book and I'm like, who? Like, I don't get it. Okay. And like reading the second book, I was like, yeah, I get it. And reading the third book, I was like, yep, I get it. I love hot set. Let's go. Also love Zainab. Also, also did not realize the gay vibes that were happening between her and Akiza. But now that I've heard it, I'm like, Oh my God. Yes. Oh, oh for sure. I like, so, like I somehow was like, I picked up on that. I mean, not, not when they first met or anything, but like then Akiza starts like training her and stuff. And then when, when Dara runs into them in the Gaziri district, when he goes to rescue the archer, whose name I can't remember, you know, one of his soldiers, like I was like, Oh, there's Ear vibes Temez. here. Ear to mess. Your Tibet, yeah. I was like, oh, there's mm-hmm. vibes here, and I am ten thousand percent. I'm proving the I can remember the miscellaneous friends characters point that you guys were making last time. <laughs> oh yeah. Speaking of Akiza and miscellaneous friends, <laughs> even though he, even though he was tragically lost, dude, you were like, <laughs> I, I, know, I almost passed like, over entirely. He was eaten by Ubaid in front of Ollie. Like, how could you forget that? I think we just we had like I I you know I wrote the summary so last minute and so quickly and he like wasn't mentioned in any of the blurbs I found online because he is in a way a minor character and he dies like part way through uh you know, through the book dramatized by his death okay I, I was saddened of course by it when it happened but then like so much happens after he dies that it's like. We're talking and talking. I'm like, what else do we have to cover? And Nick is like, wait, also, what, what happened to Lubaid? And I'm like, oh, yeah, he died. Oh, God, yeah. that's bad. Shit. Also, like, How did I not remember this? Lubaid and that whole scene. I just wanted to jump back into the Muntadir love for a second. Because that sequence when he's like, prom- when he's getting Dara to promise him that he won't harm his siblings. And Dara's like, I'll leave Zainab alone, but I'm going to kill Ali. He killed my men. And Muntadir straight up looks him in the face and he's like, you killed literally everybody he knew with the Citadel. Like, sit the fuck down, my dude. And I was just like, fuck yeah, Muntadir. Calm down, guys. Like, I'm pretty sure you guys, like, you are not equal. You owe him a lot. (laughs) I was like, every time Dara gets mad at Ali, I'm just like, are you kidding me right now? (laughs) Bud, you're mad this little boy stabbed you when you literally mur- like ju- like participated in the murder of thousands of people on the front lawn of his home and pulled down the building that he grew up in as a child and killed 99% of the people he knew there. Like, Bud? Bud? Just not to mention the fact that when Ali did the supposed like worst things he did to Dara at like the end of book one and stuff, and Dara's all mad about it. It's like Ali is like, I mean, well, you were kidnapping my BFF, who it seemed pretty clear she didn't want to go with you, and like all this, and also was was you know taken over by the Marid like when he actually you know. Killed, killed quote unquote, killed Dara. It's like, come on, come on, come on. Dara, you are you are replacing you are replacing some weird blame in some weird places there, Dara. I feel like you're projecting. What it emo boy is projecting? Mm-hmm. Emo boy is projecting. God, yeah, no, that whole thing made me so annoyed. And Munta there just being like, no, fuck you, was amazing. And Munta there just like at that whole moment where like Kave dies. 
and like he orchestrates that whole thing i was just like oh my god i was waiting for savage moon to the air planning to destroy everything and then it happened and i was like dang that was good that was good and the thing was that like he straight up goes into that expecting to either die or be executed for it and i was like i support this because he was straight up killing the person who killed all his people and speaking of this i wanted to jump to kave for a second because yeah he yeah pieces but like the absolute tragedy of the fact that you find out in this book that maniza never told him that she didn't control the poison and he thought the poison would be contained and kill only gasan like <sighs> oh i think I, no 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 i i figured that the, that that was i think fair at least at it least was, somewhat, but I think fairly clear in the second book that it was that, explicit that she decided not to tell him. Yeah, she like, said, "I'm not telling him. He doesn't need to know that. He doesn't need the guilt." It was it was one of those moments that like I listened to all of these on audiobook at three x speed, so like she kind of brushes it off, and it doesn't really matter in the moment because you don't see the effect that it has on Kave. But seeing Kave after it and his like absolute horror at what has happened and like even in the moment seeing him be like wait a second why is it spreading that shouldn't happen oh no and seeing all of that like kind of happen is absolutely heartbreaking because like dang does that man have terrible taste in women yeah yeah Hate him to pieces, but still feel like incredible pity for him yeah, and also, I mean, wasn't he literally like pulled apart or something? I mean, he was yeah. he was he was he was murdered very brutally. Uh, it was like a Game of Thrones time. brutality murder, I would say. It was it, thankfully it was less uh, described because <laughs> I, I actually just I, like I'm at the end of rereading Clash of Kings and the bread riots and they're talking about what happens to like the high septon and uh, I think it's Preston Greenfield and one of uh, maybe one other Kingsguard member. And it's like really brutal. And that's, that's in a way it's less, it's less mobbish. There's not so much a mob as there is like the, the, you know, uh, Deva or whatever that, that Muntadir has kind of gathered to, fight back um but yeah it's 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 bad and, and but it's it's definitely it's more it's off page to an extent that it's easy to brush over in the moment and it's only when manitza goes like just completely scorched earth that you realize how bad it was i think I don't know. I feel like the way it was described, like even though it was off screen, it was immensely obvious that this was brutal. Because I don't know. I can't imagine a scenario in which a mob would confront the man who literally murdered thousands in front of them would not react with incredible violence after being given weapons. So, you know, to me, the fade to blackness of that murder did not hide what I suspected was the brutality of it and having that confirmed later was just sort of like yep as I thought that was horrific and you got what you deserved and yep. also like poor Jamshid because oh man like his mother is a murderous piece of shit and his father wasn't like he was a good dad to him, but he wasn't a great person. And then, but also had like this brutal death. And like, and then he finds out that Nari was like gonna just kind of like give him up. Like, like you know, it's it's we're gonna kill your brother if you don't do this. And she's like, fine, kill him. Like, I'm calling your bluff. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> Jim Sheed, a politician, realizes the two most important people in his life that are still alive are politicians. Oh, Jim, I don't. I don't think Jim Sheed was a politician at no, all. Jim actually, Jim Sheed was a politician. He actually specifically talks about it in Tanitri. Like, there's a conversation he has with Nari at some point. He's like, "Not to be the politician here, but this is what we should do." And I remember that sticking out to me because I also didn't think he was really a politics dude. But he hung yeah. out with like um, Muntadir as his guard so often that it seems obvious that he would be able to, especially with the Grand Wazir as his dad. 
So like the reveal that he gets it, but just also does not like to was like, in my opinion, very good. At least in the end, he man. ends up with Eye Patch Muntadir. I who I imagine being very rakish and handsome in his <laughs> eye patch, you know. He's just I'm pretty sure he's like he's like locking that thing to Jim Sheet all the time. He's like, got my eye on you and like other like <laughs> lame bullshit like that. And he's like, he's like, do I look handsome and rakish? I'm a pirate. I feel like Munta there would be really into role play. <laughs> I agree. Uh, speaking of pirates, we haven't really, we haven't really gone. We, I don't think we need to go into depth in this, but like, I really liked. Uh, how do you pronounce your name? Pizza, Faiza, 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 Faiza. Okay, I really liked Faiza. She's real cool. She I like cool. how she was like, "Fuck you, Ali. You're not going out on this boat by yourself. I'm going with you." And like, that she just good. becomes like his right hand person, and like. I, she, that was really, I loved all of that, like, especially knowing that she was this, you know, Shafiq girl who was, they, I mean, they were essentially enslaved. They had that, you know, what it was, mm -hmm. the, the, the chip or whatever in their neck that, I, oh gosh, like, and, and Nari, like. It was fantasy I, microchipped, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, no, I, I feel like I don't have a lot to say about Ali's arc and about the Ali Nari romance. Cause like I saw that coming and I'm happy it happened. And also like Ali's arc was just like, it was just very satisfying to be like, ah, oh, yes, we find the origin of your mystery fishman powers. Go Aquaman Ali. And it was just, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I think I, Ali's like pirate romp fishman adventures were just really, really fun. And I enjoyed it. And that's what I got. I love Ali. What a good boy. Uh yeah, I I I I'm a little sad for him for for losing, you know, his like Deva, his fire powers. Um, and he's obviously sad about it too. I the the romance thing though, it's very like it's obvious in the end that there is one, of course, you know, and and I mean really throughout the book, obviously, but uh, you know, but also at the end they him and it's not like him and Nari are just together, right? Or did I like totally yeah, miss that? Is. It it was like kind of written as a we're still working this out and it's a new and tentative thing, mm -hmm. but we are together. They're definitely like together and or thinking about it and are working towards it by the end. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Any 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 thoughts on the pirates, Nick? I loved them. Really? Sorry, I'm not Nick. They're, I did. They're love great, them. but. I don't really have any thoughts on them. Um, or well, I, I guess really Leslie. like the pirate. The pirates as a whole existed. It's really only Faiza that we, yeah. you know, we, we don't really get much of any of the others. Um, gosh, I, there's so there's like so much like to discuss. But I guess uh, okay. So one thing obviously that I wanted to go back to, and I don't think we have. Oh, oh, one of the things we talked about last time was the morally gray dilemmas and how Nick and I were like, we see that there are some morally gray things, but is it true morally gray or is it just morally gray because one thing is obviously the right decision but isn't necessarily like the way everybody wants it to turn out. Um, so yeah, I have like big thoughts on it. Cause like the conclusion <laughs> that y'all basically came up with by the end of it was that like, it's not morally gray because one of these solutions was obviously like, it's very clear that one is right and one is wrong. And like, you're absolutely correct. These are not morally gray dilemmas at all, but they are real dilemmas, which is something that you don't see in fantasy at all, because it's very, because in fantasy and in a lot of fiction and in a lot of just stories in general, the decisions that you're faced with are very obviously good and bad, and it's very easy and obvious to choose the mm -hmm. good. And that's never like what a real decision is like in terms of morality, in terms of being a better person. And I think the best thing about this story and the reason this series as a whole is so compelling and the reason, you know, you come to, we came to the end of the first book and we were and like most of us were just like, oh my God, I'm so frustrated with everybody. Like the reason all of those things hold true is because the dilemmas in this story aren't 
good versus bad like they are in most fantasy stories. It was good versus safe or good versus self-serving or good versus easy. And it was it was a lot more akin to the decisions that we face in real life because it's never going to be a straight good or bad decision. The reason it's difficult to choose the good thing to do is because the other decision, while technically bad, is probably going to be better for you or better for the people you love or like the easier thing to do or the safer thing to do. And that's why this book is just so, so good because, and that's why these characters are so frustrating because as a third party reading it, you can obviously look at this and be like, well, this is obviously the good one. Why aren't they doing that? And the fact that they continue to make, quote, the wrong choices or the bad choices is part of why this series is so compelling because it's like, it really does mimic life in that way. And it's more realistic than the, ah, should I do murder or should I not do murder? Well, murder's bad, so I will not. And like, like it's very much, it's not that. It's like, it's like, do I destroy the ring of power? Do I keep the ring of power? <laughs> well, I destroy it because ring of power bad. And it's it's very much not that. And it's there's so much more like. Like the decisions might not be difficult as a reader to look on, but they are decisions that are difficult for the character. And that's what makes it compelling. And I think people are mistaking morally gray for difficult because these decisions yeah. are not morally gray. There yeah. is a correct answer. It ain't gray. It is correct versus not. But it is a difficult decision to make because life fucking sucks. And that's so a good way to put it. it. That's a good way to put it. Like that they're not, they're not just because they're difficult doesn't make them morally gray. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I was, I, I really, and Nick and I talked about this two weeks ago. Like I, I, we were both just kind of surprised that people were saying these were morally great decisions. And it's like, I mean, no, not really. You keep, um, you keep using that word. I do not. I don't think it means. I think it means. <laughs> <laughs> like that was that was straight up me when I heard people describe it as that like with like weird terminology things again like people describe this ending as bittersweet but I I also like kind of disagree with that I think this was the most satisfying ending we could have gotten it was like a good kind of like bow tie of everybody's stories in a way like it ended everything and it covered everything and I think the reason people call it bittersweet is because Dara was banished and he was a main character and you don't get like that payoff <laughs> being fully redeemed which also if you wanted that you're garbage like i'm sorry but like you kind of are dara does still suck and like oh my gosh when i was looking for summaries like for this book not not to like totally interrupt you nami but i have to say this when i was looking for summaries for this book because this kind of feeds into that i like googled a couple different you know terms and like the top question was does nari end up with dara and i was like <gasps> Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah no and like i think the other reason it's considered bittersweet is because nari doesn't end in power and like she moves to the shafi district and like muntadir also gives up the throne and like is playing house essentially with jamshid and i feel like in a lot of fantasy stories you end up with like the main character becoming king or queen and without that ending people were like oh it's bittersweet and i'm like power isn't the end goal like they're happy and they're doing it like y'all that's not bittersweet this is actually like really goddamn sweet like like this is, all, a good I think of is all i can think of is who has a better story than brand the broken yep <laughs> literally like immediately everybody. thinking about and, and then you have brand <laughs> oh gosh but well, that's the show about that the better yeah yeah um I don't know, Nick, did you, how do you feel about the bittersweet thing? I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I feel like that's, I, I don't get it at all. I don't get it. It at wasn't all, bittersweet. But... Like I know what bittersweet is. This ain't it, bud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, the word seems wrong to me. I, I understand and agree with what Nami was saying. Like, I don't think it's like everybody gets a happy ending. It's complicated and messy and nobody really ends up in like, they won kind of position, but that's usually how the world works. Like people don't usually just win. Well, and also I think the important thing is, did any of them want to? 
You know what I mean? I don't think Nari wanted to be in power. I don't think, you know, Muntadir, he might have wanted to be want in it, power. But I, I I think well, I think that I think that what he wanted, like I think him wanting to be like to, to rule was in direct contradiction with what he could have with Jamshid. So I think it was, I think with him, it was always a tug of war, honestly. But and, was, but in the end, in the end, he's had enough, man. He's had enough. Also, and that's also, the choice you he you made off. is the choice okay. he made for himself. I'm going to cut you off real quick because there's that specific sequence where you like learn about like the desires that they had in that like courtesan, like mm. brothel thing. And you and like you specifically see that Muntadir's desire is not the throne; it's to be happy with Jamshid. I don't think there was ever a tug of war. I think the tug of war that occurred was because Ghassan was alive, and there were these expectations, and there was literally no other way for Muntadir to exist except to be Emir that he was doing it. And that's truly what I believe for his character, because it really looks like the moment that like that wasn't happening anymore. He was like, "All right, we're not doing it," and. I don't know. That might just be my like very kind of black and white interpretation of it by the end. And I do agree that he also was definitely very much sick of it and was just like, nah, I'm done. But I think saying he actually wanted the throne is a really strong positive desire that I don't think he ever had. I think it was just all he ever knew that he could be and therefore he had to be it because there was no other option. I really like him to there. <laughs> Oh yeah, I know we we got into that in the last episode. I mean, Nick has I, I, I'm assuming your opinion of Muntadir hasn't changed at all from this Not book. Enough. If anything, Not if enough. anything, this book made us love him more, probably. Oh yeah, because in the last that book we had some totally parts where he was really shitty. Uh like when he literally the beginning, like, yeah. lies and uh about the whole thing that Kave has uh, plotted and says he doesn't know anything about it. But like in this book, he's mostly just trying to survive and being the Muntadir that we fell in love with uh, in the first book. So, yep. If anything, I just love him more. Yeah, I think it was one of those, like, it's kind of freeing seeing him in this book because you could see him as what he was without Gassan's influence. And I think that was a lot of what yeah. like Nari talked about in her POV and a lot of what Ali was like lamenting kind of in his POV. And he's like, I don't get why Muntadir and I are fighting. Like we should be on the same side. I don't get it. I don't get it. And like you see that like a lot of the bad qualities that Muntadir had and a lot of the bad ways he reacted to things was because like He's like, I'm sorry, Dad. Please love me. Well, and Muta Deer's a good example of somebody who was kind of traumatized by their parent and circumstances and didn't end up being a homicidal, uh, baby-murdering person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the the like kind of reveal at the middle end when Jim Sheed is like, yeah, Ali, we didn't tell you because like Muntadir was afraid you would hate him because you're kind of crazy religious and that's scary at times. And I think that was just such like a moment of like, like, because I know you guys were talking a lot about how, how like in the previous book, it was very much like everybody knew it was an open secret. They were like, ah, they're gay. We don't care. And the fact that they were, like, hiding it from Ali because they thought he would care because of, like, how he grew up. Like, mm -hmm. that was the moment when it was, when you, like, where you really did see that conflict more. Then meanwhile, Ali's like, but I love you guys. I don't get it. Also, three hour later, wait, they're boyfriends? <laughs> Ali, you dumbass. <laughs> oh, my God. I oh, never snored. Yeah. That was amazing. Ali's so <laughs> dumb. He made me snort. Proud of you, bud. <laughs> but, like, yeah, no, that whole thing, it was, like, it was, like, very heartbreaking because, like, I super get that. Like thinking your sibling won't like you because like gay and Same. yeah. Let it be known, it was not a fear. I told my sister I was me alive. introducing my college girlfriend as my friend. 
Yeah, no, but I told my sister she, I was by and she bought me like a backpack with a rainbow on it. And she was like, here, go be gay. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, I get that so much. And it was just like, oh, and Ali being like, but I would never. And then him also stopping and being like, oh, wait, but like I might have. Shit. And like that yeah. whole introspection mm-hmm. for him, like, her book one Ali would have never done that kind of in- introspection. Good job, buddy. We love growth in this house. Yeah. Hashtag we love growth in this house. <laughs> um, so uh, one last thing to talk about before we end everything is the main themes of this series, uh, which they, they there's a bunch of really great quotes about it, um, et cetera. Uh, but the, the endless cycle of revenge for justified wrongs, which that's Nami's words, uh, like the... Oh gosh, just over and over and over again, right? How they, they, and again, like I said, they, I don't think there's any specific ones that I highlighted from this book, but it comes up again and again and again that they, the, the, when they finally reach this understanding, each, you see it, I think, with each of the main characters, maybe, maybe not with Dara. I don't know, but you definitely do with with Nari repeating it a lot and Ali as well. Like this just if we keep going here, if we if we don't make a change, then it's just going to continue as it's always been. And that's bad. Like I I think you do actually see it with Dara at the end. Because at the end, he's the one who, like, you know, tells Nari that he needs to leave and become the scapegoat for this so that, like, his soldiers who followed him without knowing the true extent of Manaiza's crimes wouldn't be, like, 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 remembered badly and, like, attacked rightfully because of what they did without knowing. And, like, so he's like, I really need to leave and take all of this responsibility on myself so Devabad can move on. And I think, you know, by the very end, Dara gets it. Because, like, he starts off his whole story just, like, being so stuck in his revenge for what happened to his family that, mm-hmm. like, by the end, the fact that he does understand that he needs to leave because there can't be peace with a war criminal like him who did that twice. It, well, like, once in the past and once, like, literally five, like, two days ago. And, like, the fact <laughs> that he gets that, I do think he, he understands by the end. Still a naive idiot. Idiot. The dumbest. Go worship a Nagi. The dumbest boy. Dumb. He's a himbo. He's a himbo. He's a himbo, except he's a himbo gone horribly wrong. He's a himbo, except instead of, like, being adopted by, like, a talking raccoon, like Thor got with Rocket, he gets adopted by Thanos. And then he's like, Thanos is my dad. I love him. And that's... That's Dara. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, so, so uh, yeah, endless cycles of uh, revenge, which is about wrongs, and endless cycles of killing as revenge that create more justified wrongs. Again, these are Nami's words. Um, uh, the people in power don't you know, suffer or die for their actions, but others do. I think that's an important thing to touch on before we close too. There was that whole point that you guys made in the last webcast of like, it was so weird that like no main characters died. And even now none of like your main good guy characters died. And like, Mm -hmm. it was a continuing theme through the first two books when Nari was under Gassan's control. And when Ali was directly under Gassan's control that they would never be harmed. Anything that they did wrong, others would be harmed because of them, to punish them. And, like, it was a theme with Maniza and, like, Rustam being tortured to make her obey Gassan. It's an ongoing theme that the people in power never have to suffer. And, like, every mistake that Nari makes, Devas are killed for it or the Shaw Feeder killed for it. Every mistake that Ollie makes, like Shaw Feeder killed for it, Gaziri are killed for it. Every mistake that Dara makes, Devas are killed for it. And like, you know, it, it continues that cycle. Like the only people that actually die are, you know, Nizreen, like main, main characters, Nizreen, Kaveh, Ghassan, Maniza. 
it's all the main bads and like it really like it dry it in a way the like lack of main character death in a book with so much in a book series with so much death is all the more horrifying because you realize that all your main characters are like rich and powerful and none of them die because they are powerful and it's like <sighs> i don't disagree but i also think there's a lot of opportunity not that i necessarily want any of them to die but there were a lot of not, not main main characters but like not minor characters that you could have had that were not bad guys but you could have easily had be casual and we well, did except for Lubay. yeah because like Lubade does die um moon to the air and um oh my god goodness i forgot her name but um jara's military friend they both are crippled um like you know there are like injuries and horrific things happening but like i don't know it's just like it's like every single person who dies is minor or not wealthy or distinctly yeah. evil and, and like, it's like it very much highlights the whole like gap in privilege and power that they show in this book series the whole time and it like it show it, it's just like right there yeah i mean i guess my, oh go ahead my go ahead that, uh, for people like us who literally spend hours dissecting these books and like coming back to these themes and specifically looking for those themes i absolutely agree with you i don't think the the average reader does that oh like, for sure, I mean, yeah. sure it really drives home that uh that discrepancy in power for the average reader I think the only reason it sticks to me is because so much of the first two books of when Nori is under Gassan's control is her thinking about and fearing her actions because she knows Shafi and Deva will be killed for it. And I think that's what drives it home, in my opinion, but I still think it, it's not something you everybody can pick up on. But I think yeah. it's definitely there. It's definitely like oh. super there. Absolutely agree that it's there. Yeah, and I think that, I think that like, uh, it's hard because we complain about no major characters dying, and some of that might be just that this is what we're used to. I think in, it might be Game of Thrones syndrome. It might, yeah, you know, honestly, that might be it because I'm, I'm trying to think, and it's like, in Lord of the Rings, like you lose, you know, like. Who are the characters you you that, that you lose that you care about? Like Theoden, Boromir, maybe. I would not even how you feel about really Boromir. Care about Theoden. I would say the only person you could actually care about, and this is only from the book standpoint, is Boromir because otherwise Boromir is kind of like the neutral kind I don't of. No, Theoden is like he's the king of the writers of Rowan. Like he dies on the battlefield, man. Like he's the. He's pretty like legit. Like I think that's I think that's honestly I th think his death was more sad than Boromir. Yeah, but maybe. but I mean you know it, it, and and then I I don't want to get too much into like sh the the, the Grisha verse. Um, but we lose some you know fairly important characters in that in those those series, not that series, mm -hmm. but those all of those series. Uh, so maybe maybe it's just. <laughs> Maybe maybe it's just like I'm used to like like you said like Game, like Game of Thrones always, syndrome. I feel like uh, I'm still shocked when a main character dies, like a truly main character. I think you know with a book series that has like I think for me it's like if a POV character dies, that's what I consider shocking. And I think yeah. Game of Thrones sort of normalize that but when you really think about it in terms of most fantasy like that level of death is not normal like of main no, characters, yeah, you're, like, you're not like, wrong main characters tend to survive everything it's why it's called like main character syndrome and like and like pretty much everybody survives unless it's like a giant cast of characters and like yeah. i think 
like when you really think about Grishaverse, like it's not until sh um, Kingdom of or, uh, Crooked Kingdom that somebody actually dies. That's a main character I would consider. Because even in the main Shadow and Bone trilogy, you have characters yeah. die, but they are technically minor characters, peripheral characters who are named and like you get a little bit of interaction with them. But it's not until Crooked Kingdom that a main character dies. And then in King of Scars, a main character who was never a POV character also dies. And like, I think like the shadow and bone level of death is what we are technically used to in fantasy, but we're also Game of Thrones fans here. And I think we forget that. <laughs> yeah, you might be right. And also to be honest, like I, I talked about this in the last episode. I, I think I'm just like jaded and that like, I don't, I don't want, a book series where like all the main characters like live and have happy endings and I, that's a me problem okay yeah. <laughs> i was gonna say that's like, a me I, problem because I, I, I expect it to be guys. truly bittersweet <laughs> yeah this one called it bittersweet so i would have i would have thought it was bittersweet because a main character died and then no main characters died and i'm like why is it bittersweet they're all living and they're all actually kind of thriving right now like this is great like sign me up man <laughs> And like, I don't know, like there was for me, like I read Crooked Kingdom and I was like shocked because a main character died. Like, like I read um, Gilded Wolves and I was shocked because a main character died. Like, like in these books to me, like despite the Game of Thrones, everyone is fair game mentality. I still get really shocked when a main character dies, which is why rereading Game of Thrones is always traumatic. <laughs> yeah, I can speak to that right now. Uh, okay, so any any last thoughts on the whole, like, the themes, the endless cycle of revenge, you know, people in power don't suffer for their actions, anything like that, before we move on to our final question? No. No? All right. Uh, so the question this week posed, I'm guessing, by Nami, because it certainly wasn't me that typed this in here. Not that I'm judging. I'm just saying, like, I didn't put this in here. So thank you, Nami, for adding this question. At the end of the series, who are our faves? And I'd say let's try to top this off at three. Three characters per person. So, uh, Nick, you go first. All right. Uh, I would say Muntadir... Hopset and uh, Jamshid. Those are my I like favorite. it. Any any specific reasons why, or just? I just I like them all as being uh, flawed, interesting characters who don't do like well. Montadir does some pretty not good stuff, and but like overall, I don't feel like they did anything like horrible that wasn't within their. Uh, it didn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, John Shed even like poisons Ali at one point, but it's we get it. He loves Montadir. He was worried about Montadir. He was trying to protect his boyfriend. <laughs> All right, Nami, what about you? So I'm going with the sibling trifecta. Mine is Montadir, Ali, Ali, and Zainab. Um, well, Zainab, it is because, you know, like, first book, she literally just seems like the mean girl. And, like, you get so much more of her in books two and three. And, like, her locking her brothers in a closet and literally being like, talk it out, you goddamn idiots, was just such a mood that I was like, yep, correct. Yeah. And when she was like, I'm sick and tired of, like, men, like, just making decisions for me, like, calm thine titties, I was like, yes, you are correct, Zainab. <laughs> and then this... What, this book when she's like basically like leading this rebellion and like learning how to fight and just all of it I love her she's really doing great and like the reveal in book two that she was the one who hatched the scheme to get Ollie back because she missed her brother and was so worried for him I was just like oh man like I just I really love her and Ollie I like his character growth because his is more subtle than everybody else's but he goes from an uncompromised uncompromising religious zealot hard ass into a compromising still religious but like genuinely good man who now understands gray areas and i just i really like that journey for him and for also like to actually get along with his brother and understand that people are can't just be like this good this bad 
do good, damn it. And and him kind of like getting off that moral high horse. Like his his story arc was like, what could have happened to Ned Stark if Ned Stark lived? <laughs> and, and I think it was Jonathan in our group chat who unfortunately couldn't yeah. make it again tonight because he has family stuff going on. But like um, who said that he compared Ali to Ned. He's like, he's a more religious Ned. Star, yeah, that, uh, that very it. unbreaking, like unbendable, like not quite Stannis unbendable, but <laughs> but it was also very much like I remember in the first book when he was like, "Oh my God, they're using weapons! How dare they? That's evil!" And he was like, "Me!" And then like he gets it by later on. He's like, "Oh, they have to fight back!" And like and like you, that journey for him from like oh no, everything's evil. The rules say that they can't have weapons and the rules are always good. And like that journey for him, love that journey for him. A plus, well done. That's my son. Um, And then finally, went to the air, who you guys already know that I love and adore. And I think the moment that really solidified it for me, because I'm not you, actually, who am I kidding? I always love the womanizer characters. And then the fact that him and like Jim Sheed had this like secret gay pining thing going on, like since book one, I was like, yes, this man's my favorite. And then he had like that, like piles of insecurity in book two, when he just made billions of terrible decisions because he was so insecure. I'm like, oh no, no. And just, I got it so much. And then like in this book, the moment that solidified him as my favorite was when Dara is doing his whole, like, I'm gonna kill your brother. And he's like, bitch, bitch, Ollie has all the reason to hate you. And you're gonna sit down and accept that. Like, cause nobody had actually called Dara out on his bullshit to his face in a logical manner. Cause Ali tried, but Ali's like such a self-righteous little little pricky boy in the first book that like you're just like it's very easy to ignore him i love alita pieces but book one ollie was an insufferable brat with a stick up his butt and i stand by that and i love him but so like muntavir calling like dara on this was the first time somebody actually called dara out in a way that would hurt him for his hypocrisy and i was like yes muntavir yes <laughs> uh so before I answer this myself, what about Lubaid, Nami? <laughs> what about Lubaid? I wish they could have happily lived this in this <laughs> little Gaziri desert house. Just, just happy in the desert. Lubaid didn't deserve this shit. Poor Lubaid. Uh, so I'm gonna go. A little bit weird at, at, with my third choice, but Hatsa and Zainab are my first two. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, Hatsa is power mom and I love her. Uh, she was Zainab, a Yeah, like Zainab, I'm with you, Nami. Like, I love her journey. Like, you see her as just a mean girl, but she is actually like just so awesome. And like how she turns out in the end and how she just gets to like she's going on it like her choice is to go on adventures with her hopefully soon to be like girl official girlfriend <laughs> like please that again i still want these little novellas about zayna's <laughs> adventures um so i loved her the third character is really hard obviously i love ali's character arc i love muntadir i really like jamshid too um, but I think my third favorite character is actually Sobek. Ooh, Ooh okay. okay. I really, like, even though we don't know much at all about him until this book, uh, I really enjoyed the backstory of how Nari's ancestors was it her mother mother her mother yeah her mother you know her helped him mother. the way the way he talked about her mother and the way he helped ali really like when they were when when tiamat like said like fight to the death and he like so yeah, it's real quick i, I it's just implied that it's not the mother who helps him but it's her mother's human ancestors in egypt okay okay and that they like hand down the like worship of Sobek. Yeah. And I, I just, it was, it was, he's one of those characters where like, we didn't really get enough of him in my opinion. And I just really, I 
he's maddening in a lot of ways, but I really enjoyed, well, and of course, obviously, like, not great in terms of the whole, like, human sacrifice of, like, being bloodthirsty. <laughs> like, listen, not not a great, quote unquote, person, but I really, I really enjoyed like in fairness, he's a crocodile, so like yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it's not it's not entirely his fault, right? That he needs yeah. crocodiles eat meat. Human just <laughs> big meat. So I know that's a really weird choice, but I really like I I try to think about like who did I really enjoy learning about the most in this series, and he was shockingly, weirdly, maybe the the third and again it's more because it's like i love all these other characters and there's so much i have to say about them you know both maddening and positive but in the end it's like this guy though this yeah. guy but yeah. i'm also a minor character person like you asked me who my favorite game of thrones characters are and like dolorous ed absolutely makes it into the top five <laughs> so, just saying um, I'm kind of right. like offended that Lubaid isn't in your top three. Then, like, <laughs> oh, listen, I freaking love Lubaid, but he, we only get one, not even a whole book with him. No. You know, like we don't. We it, it, he's fun and he's cool, but he's there and then he's gone. Sadly, R.I.P. Lubaid. Everybody, take a you know, cheers, Lubaid. Now he doesn't have a drink. Cheers, right Lubaid. I have water. I could cheers, Lupe. Water works. That's fine. All right. Lupe well. says hydrate or dehydrate because he grew up in a desert. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> hydrate or dehydrate. Oh, it's <laughs> terrible. He did really love Ali for his uh, abil water abilities. Also, I love the reveal that he was just kind of like, dude, did you think we didn't notice something was weird about you? Like, we, we <laughs> you literally used to disappear underwater for hours at a time, dude. Like, <laughs> like all these like, but I was so subtle. And he's just like, bro, you were not. <laughs> we'll keep uh, using this word. All right. Well, on that note, once again, I'm Tara along with Nick and Nami. Thank you for joining us for Sagas and Sass. And we will see you next time when we go back to the last three books in the Temerary series, beginning with book seven, Crucible of Gold. Uh, yay, we're closing season two with the last three books of the Temerary series. And then we will have a holiday special in December as well. Uh, the subject is still TBD, but we'll see you in a couple weeks with more Temerary. Bye. 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 Bye.